Hello and welcome to chapter eight. What do you think about when you think about accounting? If you think about it in terms of just how people account for all of their finances, that might get you part of the way there. Think about kind of organizing all of the money that you're bringing in and all the money that you have to pay out in expenses and then kind of building a budget based on that information so that you can make better financial decisions. That's gonna get us a, a really basic definition of what accounting is. All right, so as we roll through this chapter, we're just gonna, we're gonna talk about what accounting is, some of the people who use accounting information, the different types of accountants. We'll also talk about some of the purposes of one of the standardized ways that we, we do accounting. And we'll also talk about the major financial statements as well as a couple of additional types of financial statements. And then we'll talk about some of the methods that stakeholders can use to glean information from financial statements. We'll talk about the budgeting process and we'll finish up with some managerial accounting and cost concepts. Okay, so if we look at, if we think of accounting as just a, essentially a way to keep track of everything we're doing financially within a company, that gets us most of the way there. Because what we're really trying to do is make sure that we can make the best economic decisions possible for the company. All right, so who in that world cares about financial information? Well, on, one, on the one hand, Let's take managers. Obviously, the managers that work for a company would certainly care, right? Uh, for example, a marketing manager would want to use accounting information to gain information about sales, maybe, in different territories, so they can make better decisions about how to manage their marketing campaigns. Um, I, I was a manager at a company. I did, we did project management for federal contracts. So I was given some, a set of financial data that helped me track my uh, profit margin as in all the money that I bring in for my project as well as all my expenses. And I used this accounting system to help me make better, better decisions about you know, what kind of resources I need, needed for my project team how much I was gonna to have to pay for those resources every time I had to pay out money or I had uh, you know, any other kinds of expenses. All that information went into my accounting system and it helped me to make better project-related decisions. The last number, the, la the last page, the last number in that page uh, gave me my profit margin so it, I, I had instant feedback on how well I was doing on, in managing my project. So that's just one example from my experience on, on how I might use financial information or accounting information. When you guys first graduate from school, right away you might not be uh, in charge of other people, but I assure you by your second or third promotion, you will be managing other people and you will like, at that point you will likely be given a a budget, for example, for your area. And as part of that budget, you're gonna to have to, you'll, you'll be having to keep track of accounting information so that you can make better decisions. Stockholders would be another uh, stakeholder group that would be interested in accounting information. For example, if you are going to invest a large amount of money in a, a company, you'd probably wanna know if they were doing well financially so that you could decide if their, if you felt their stock was worth the stock price that you're gonna to have to pay for it. Um, maybe you'd wanna look at accounting information over time so you could see if you think they were trending towards uh, a good return for your investment. How about employees for a company? If you're working for a company and let's say that you are bucking for a raise, wouldn't you want to, you'd probably want to know if 
if the company was doing well or not, because if it was doing really, really well and you felt like you had a good part in that success, then you know you could go into your that conversation with your boss with uh, uh, some pretty good information about you know whether the company could afford to give you a raise or not. On the other hand, if your company was not doing very well, well, it probably wouldn't be the time to ask for a raise. You might instead want to kind of start polishing up your resume and maybe looking uh, at another company for opportunity. Uh, creditors and suppliers kind of in the same boat and caring about a company's uh, accounting information. Essentially, before they're going to uh, finance something or extend credit to a company, they want to know that they're how likely they are to get their money back to get paid. Government agencies certainly care about accounting of a, a company because they want to know if they're paying their taxes, if they're following the law when it comes to finances. The news media, of course, they report on businesses. So they are always interested in how businesses are doing, and they look at their financial data as one of their key sources for that knowledge. Now, one thing is I want you to understand, too, is that publicly traded corporations have to file an annual report every year. Part of that annual report is the financial statements of the company. Once those, that annual report is filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, that becomes publicly available information. And unfortunately, your competitors have access to that publicly available information. So they are often taking a hard look at the annual reports, that those financial statements of their key competitors, to see if they can kind of figure out what they're doing and how they're financing things. Then, of course, similar to employees, unions are often looking at the health of a company uh, to give them ammo going into uh, contract negotiations asking such as you know asking for better pay or better benefits the company is not doing well that would be a time where they may hold off on some of those those types of negotiations until the comp until business turns around but those are the types of stakeholder groups that might be interested in the accounting information of a company Let's talk about a little bit about some of the different types of accountants there are. Um, so a public accountant, think of a public accountant as an accountant that works outside of your company, doesn't work for your company directly. That would be a public accountant. That's the accountant you would go to, to uh, if you wanted to outsource someone uh, helping your company prepare their taxes, or let's say that you are a public publicly traded corporation is, as such, one of the legal requirements is that you have an external audit performed and that auditor's report has to accompany your annual report each year. That is a legal requirement. So the type of accountant that you would seek out to conduct that audit would be a public accountant. And then, of course, public accountants, they also uh, you know, work for consulting firms and they would conduct the accounting portion of those consulting gigs. Uh, management accountants, think of those as the accountants that work inside your company. And we talked about those a little bit. Managers at each level of the organization, surely they are looking at accounting information so they can make better decisions. But you also have accountants that work for your, for your business that do things like prepare uh, the financial statements, uh, prepare the company's taxes, um, and those are going to be the go-to people that will help managers with their accounting questions, financial questions. We usually go to them. And then lastly, your government accountants on this sheet. Government accountants, every government agency has their own set of accountants that help manage money for that government agency. And these are also the accountants that would perform audits, like uh, the IRS. If, if you are ever on the unfortunate side of being subject to an, an audit by the IRS as a business, 
And a government accountant is, is would come in and do that audit. If you get a personal audit, for that matter, uh, a government accountant from the IRS would come and conduct that audit. All right, let's also take a look at what financial accounting is. It's, it's one of the branches of accounting. So main thing that I would remember here is that they're preparing financial statements for the owners of the company. So those are going to be used by all those stakeholder groups we talked about a moment ago. But So we'll talk about each of those financial statements here in a moment. One of the things that uh, we try to do too as we're doing accounting uh, is we all want to be on the same sheet of music and kind of do accounting the same way. If you were to pull a group of people and ask them how they do their personal finances, you're likely to get a variety of answers. Because we all do things differently. You might just do it in your head. You might have an Excel spreadsheet. You might use an app. You might use some sort of online website. You might just use the tools that uh, are included with your online banking. So we all do things differently. Well, if you're trying to compare uh, the financials of all these different types of people who use all these different ways of doing their own personal accounting, it would be kind of hard to make those comparisons because of the way people do things is so different. Well, businesses would be no, no different uh, if they were all using completely different ways of doing accounting. So we try to utilize the same standardized sets of procedures and those are called GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. All right, so if you are to get a question, by the way, on the test, that says, who has ultimate responsibility for managing GAAP? The answer is the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. They have ultimate responsibility for managing GAAP. However, they typically delegate the regular updating of GAAP to an organization or a, a committee called the FASB. That is a group of seven individuals that are selected to serve five-year terms, and they are charged with keeping GAAP relevant. We, remember we discussed in chapter one that business is constantly changing and evolving. Well, if that's true then, it probably means that the way we do accounting needs to change along with it. So the FASB is charged with keeping it updated, making changes so that it stays relevant, that we can verify information to make sure that it's reliable that is consistent so that we can also compare company A against uh, an industry average or against its competitors or really just bus any business of like size. So that's what the FASB does. Okay, so let's, let's talk about each of the three major financial statements. Let's start with the balance sheet. Okay, so essentially, the balance sheet explains in a very simplistic terms a snapshot of how the company is balanced. What, how many assets, what assets does it own and how did it pay for those assets? So that sounds really simplistic, but it has a lot of uses. If you understand what assets you own how you paid for those assets, you're in a better position to understand your profit potential as a company. So assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. That is also known as the accounting equation. The logic is this. It essentially says all of the assets that a company owns had to have been paid for somehow. So, therefore, assets either were financed through people from outside the company. Those people from outside of the company would be like your, your, uh, a bank, any of your creditors, essentially. They financed all of those assets through debt of some kind. Okay? 
And then another way to pay for your assets is they could have been from the owners. The owners could have paid for it. For example, in a sole proprietor, well, the sole proprietor could have simply taken that money out of the company's account and paid for it with money that the company has earned. If it was a corporation, for example, well, in that case, the owners of the company are the shareholders. So often a corporation will sell shares of stock to earn money that they will use to finance the growth of the company. So if the company paid for some of its assets with that money, then on the balance sheet, you record that as owner's equity. So using that logic, all the assets had to either been paid for with liabilities or owner's equity. All right, let me point out a couple of things on this slide too. Your assets are typically categorized into some major categories. One is current assets, meaning those assets that are expected to be converted into cash within 12 months, or your longer term assets like property, plant, and equipment. That's the second category. Those are obviously longer term assets. You're not gonna convert those into cash anytime soon. And then you also have intangible assets. Intangible assets are things like uh, your branding, that's definitely worth, worth something. Trademarks, patents, those are all intangible assets. Those are worth a lot of money. And there's an entire process for making assigning dollar values to those, those items. Two categories I want would remember for liabilities. Current asset or current liabilities, which are those short-term liabilities. In other words, they are expected to become due within 12 months. And then your longer term liabilities. So those are debts that you're paying out over a longer period of time. And then as far as categories of owner's equity, well, that depends on what type of business entity the, the organization was uh, chartered as. All right, next let's look at the income statement. Now, if the balance sheet was a snapshot of a moment in the time, the income statement is shows the financial health of a company over a period of time. The income statement is also known as a profit and loss statement or P&L, P&L. Okay, so don't get tripped up on the exam if you if it uses one of those two different wordings for that same statement, okay? Essentially, the income statement summarizes a company's financial results over a period of time, okay? The figure that gets the most attention, of course, on the income statement is net income. That answers the question, how much money did we make? Very important, right? So the organization of a, of the income statement is based essentially on a very, very simple equation, which is revenue, all that money that you earn from selling your stuff, minus all your expenses, gives you net income, also known as the bottom line. Now, revenue, again, that's the amount of cash or other assets, such as accounts receivable, that, that you earn during a period of time. One thing I want to point out here is that in accrual-based accounting, you don't necessarily, you don't really wait until you get the cash for something. It's when you earn them. So as an example, if you are selling your products to other businesses, you might let them take delivery of a month of your supplies um, and not make them pay for them up front. You're usually you're gonna give them an invoice with that delivery that might say something like net 30. That means they have 30 days to pay you, but they've already taken possession of it. Now, in accrual-based accounting, what that means though, is that you would actually record that revenue that you earned 
when you delivered it, in other words, or when you made that sale. That means you've got an IOU, you've already earned that income. So you would record it though in accounts receivable. That means, hey, that's the that's money that we are owed by our customers. We, we expect that we're gonna get it really soon, but we haven't gotten it yet. So you would record it in accounts receivable. Now, once you actually get paid by a customer, you would take that payment out of accounts receivable and put it to, into your cash, the cash part of your revenue account. Okay, and then expenses. The amount, expenses, you know, that's, that's expenses just like you and I have, right? So it's, it's the amount of money that your company spends or the assets it uses up in order to do business. So again, in accrual-based accounting, expenses aren't necessarily recorded when you actually pay out cash. Instead, you actually recognize expenses um, to the, they're usually matched to the revenue that those expenses helped generate. Um, so another thing I want you to know about this particular slide is that we typically recognize uh, these expenses uh, or get to income rather in three different steps. So we, sub we start out with revenue, but in our first step, we're gonna subtract out just cost of goods sold. That is the, the costs that are directly related to buying, manufacturing, or, or providing the goods and services that you sell, right? That is gonna give you gross profit. Anytime you see gross something, it means there's still expenses that need to be taken out of it. So step one, revenue minus, minus cost of goods sold, that gives us gross profit. And step two, we're gonna start with gross profit, but now we're also going to subtract operating expenses. Those are selling expenses like salaries, commissions, advertising, it's also going to, going to include general and, and administrative expenses like rent, uh, insurance, utilities, office supplies, all those things. That is going to give you net operating income. So we're getting close. So now in step three, we're going to start with net operating income and we're going to subtract out interest expenses and taxes. That is going to give us net income. Net income, if that number is positive, congratulations, you earned profit. If that number is negative, well, unfortunately, you suffered a loss. And just an FYI, it's not uncommon, uh, especially for new businesses, to operate at a loss for several months, um, sometimes even years before making a profit. So it is said that if you are operating at a loss, you are operating in the red. And you, you get that from the fact that in accounting software, if a number is negative, it is, it's red, right? So operating in the red is operating at a loss. Once you start operating at uh, a profit, in other words, operating at, in the black is how you would say it then. So that means your net income is positive. All right, the third major financial statement is the statement of cash flows. Think of the statement of cash flows very much like your bank statement, right? It shows the money that came in, like when you got paid or got your financial aid check or your parents gave you a few dollars, that's the money coming in. And then it also records all the money that that went out, all the money that you spent during the month. So for businesses, it, it's very similar, but that is called a statement of cash flows. It's showing the amount of cash that flowed into and out of the business. Now, like the income statement, this shows you how, how your company's cash budget or balance changed over the last period of time, usually over the past year. So you, you typically begin with 
your net income from the previous year. And then it would show all the money that came in and went out over the course of the year. This is a way that we can kind of see where our money is coming from and where our money is going. It's a really good way to get a handle and keep track of a company's uh, cash flows. But we do it in stages. So we'll look at the cash flows from operating activities first. That's the money that's coming into and out of based on operating activities. So operating activities would be like this, the sale of your goods and services uh, or from dividends and interest that you received on shares of stock that your company owns in other companies or the cash that your company used to cover expenses from operations or the cash that's used to purchase securities that your company has invested in that it's only going to hold for a short period of time, right? That would be cash flows in and out from operating activities. They need to have cash flows from investing activities. So that's going to be the money that comes in or out. Uh, for example, uh, the money that's coming in from the sale of fixed assets. Like if you sold a piece of land or a building the company was no longer using, that would be recognized as cash flow in from investment activities. Or if you used some cash, cash flow out, from purchasing a piece of land or a new building, or if you use some cash, cash flowing out, to purchase financial assets that the company bought as a long, longer term investment, then that would be recorded here. Now, cash flows from financing activities, that would be like the cash that you receive from issuing new shares of company stock or it, the cash that flows out uh, that you use to pay for dividends. You know, if, if you're paying dividends one year to all the stockholders in, that own stock in your company, that would be recorded here. Or if maybe you've decided you're going to buy back or repurchase some of the company stock that is out there in the marketplace, um, that would be recorded here. Or if the company took out a loan, that would be recorded here, cash flow from financing activities. Okay, There's a couple of other kinds of, of statements that we'll just touch on. Uh, one is this statement of retained earnings and these stockholders' equity statement. Those are very similar. So remember that if you're a corporation, you may sell shares of stock. The owners, that the people that own those shares of stock are called stockholders. One of the reasons that people buy shares of stock is because they can earn a dividend, which is like a little financial pat on the head um, that they get each year for owning a share of stock in a company. So if you bought a share of, say, Microsoft, um, I own some of that. I think last year I got 5 or $6 per share as a, retain, as, as a dividend that was paid to me by Microsoft. That was a dividend that I earned. So if you're a company, uh, that a publicly traded company, you have shareholders. Anytime you pay out uh, retained earnings, uh, or rather, you, let me back up. You don't always have to pay out those dividends. Sometimes you can choose to keep those earnings instead of paying it out. So when you do that, you are retaining earnings instead of paying them out as dividends. So that would be recorded as retained earnings. And so how that retained earning, those retained earnings change from one accounting period, like one year to the next, or uh, one quarter to the next, however those things change, that's where you would record it here is in your statement of retained earnings. All you really need to know about the difference between the statement of retained earnings and the stockholders equity statement, they're essentially the same. Um, is that the stockholders' equity statement is typically used for companies with more complex changes in owners' equity or stockholders' equity. Okay, so how can you make sense of a company's 
financial information, their accounting information. Well, one thing is you can take a look at the company's financial statements for sure. But you can also look at the independent auditor's report. Remember when I mentioned a moment ago that one of the things that is necessary to submit every year is an annual report. Part of that is the financial statements. Part of that annual report is also an independent auditor's report. So every year, corporations are required to have a public accountant that is somebody external to their company come in and essentially verify that what the company says are its financial uh, statements, that they're actually true. They verify their financial statements, make sure that information is true, that's relevant, it's reliable, it's following gap principles. And so that would need to be included. That independent auditor's report typically has a lot of really good information that is useful for each of those stakeholder groups we spoke about a moment ago. Now, in the notes of the financial statements, here, that's where you're going to report any details about significant changes to the way the company does their accounting. For example, sometimes companies will have changes to the way that they recognize income, for example. Well, any significant change like that would need to be recorded or explained. So that would, you would write that in your notes to the financial statements. Another thing that you can do to kind of make sense of a company's accounting uh, numbers is to look at trends. So one of the most basic types of trends is to is a horizontal analysis. And that's really all it is. If you write trend analysis next to horizontal analysis, you can remember what this is. You're essentially looking at the all your financial data from one reporting period to the next so that you can look for trends. So in other words, if, if you looked at net income over the last five years, you could draw and plotted that on a chart you could tell whether the company was doing gradually better and better or if it was gradually doing worse and worse, as an example. Okay? All right. Let's take a look at the independent auditor's report a little bit in a little bit more detail. So an independent auditor, again, that would typically be a pub, that's a public accountant, right? They would come in and spend a quite a period of time, depending on the size of the business. And they would verify, they would dig through the, the accounting system at the company and make sure that what they say is true is actually true. They would also prepare that independent auditor's report and make sure that it is prepared, done so in accordance with gap principles. This has got to be included, again, with that annual report. Okay, so a little bit more detail about those notes of the financial statements. Anything that is different about the way the company does their accounting, any special conditions. Um, maybe they had a large uh, expense that year that was out of the ordinary. Maybe they bought one of their competitors. Um, Maybe they, they divested a large portion of their operations. That would be kind of a special condition, something that doesn't happen regularly. So that's something that you would disclose in the notes of the financial statements. Um, but like the example I gave you earlier, any changes to the way that you do accounting would be recognized here or explained here. Uh, but also any risks that the company is undertaking that's definitely something that you'd want to disclose to the people reading your uh, financial statements. So for example, one, one of the, besides uh, submitting your annual report to the SEC, you're also required to submit your annual report to your stockholders. So they would definitely want to be kept aware of any plans uh, that are going to pose a risk to the financial health of the company. 
All right. So let's talk a little bit about budgeting. Budgeting for a business is very similar to the process that we use as individuals, right? It's where we're kind of planning ahead. Now, it's one thing to look at your bank statement, which is like a statement of cash flows. But if you were to create a spreadsheet and kind of plan out your your expenses and your expenses or your income and expenses going forward into the future so that you could maybe save up enough money to buy your own home, for example. You would be doing some budgeting. You may say, you know what, I'm I know that my rent for next my my rent for the coming year is gonna be uh, $1,200 per month. I know that my electricity bill is typically $100 per month and you'd go down the list and then you might say, okay, so that leaves me with X number of dollars per month spending money. Well, I'm not going to, or discretionary income. I'm not going to spend all of that. I'm going to put this amount into my savings account and try to stick to this budget. If I do this for the next five years, I'll have enough money to put 20% down on a $300,000 house or whatever the case may be, right? So that's budgeting. Well, businesses go through the same process. It's essentially a, a budgetary process that really helps a business facilitate its own planning. Uh, uh, it requires managers to start translating the goals that they're giving into really measurable quantities so they can identify the specific resources they need to achieve the goals that they're given. It also represents a company's financial position and cash flows. So it's also really important there. Some really important uh, characteristics for budgeting um, might in, it might include some things like this. Uh, estimates of revenues and expenses it expects over the coming year. Um, it might be a, uh, a good description of expected cash flows. Maybe expected debt reduction. Like, hey, you know what? Um, so expected cash flows, like maybe you're going to sell a piece of equipment or divest a piece, a part of the company. That would be some, some, some of that cash flow coming in. Uh, or maybe you're going to pay off some things like uh, we're going to pay off uh, several of our deliver our delivery trucks this coming year. So that would be an expected debt reduction. That would be part of our budgeting process. In any case, what we're going to do is we're going to compare our actual results at the end of the reporting period to what we budgeted. And then look at the at the variance between the two. And also, you'd probably want to look at the causes of any of the variances. So start with the, with the end goal. What is it we're trying to do? Then work backwards. What resources do we need to accomplish what we want to? So if your goal for the year is, uh, one of your goals is to generate $1 million in sales, great. What do you need to generate a million dollars in sales? How many delivery trucks do you need? Or how much inventory do you need? Or how many employees do you need? What, what uh, types of employees and how much do each of those types of employees cost? How many computers do you need? What is it you need to do the job that you want to do? What kind of resources do you need to accomplish that budget? And then at the end, as you go through the year and your actually getting some of that, getting revenues and uh, your, your spending money, you're adjusting that budget and it's getting more and more accurate as you move towards the end of the year. And then it just becomes something that's in the past. So now it would become part of your income statement, part of your statement of cash flows. But before then, it's budgeting. Right? You're, it's a plan, a, a plan ahead. You guys will all, all of you would get a budget at some point that you are responsible for. Maybe not right away, but by your second or third promotion, likely, you will get a budget. 
and you'll be expected to uh, stick to it. And then and there's some different ways to do budgeting, which we'll, we'll talk about here in a moment. But some of the advantages, um, for, for one, it, it really makes sure that all managers are really focused on the goals that they're given. Now, it could be the company as a whole, their goals. It could be a departmental goal. It depends on what level of manager is doing the budgeting. But it forces managers to focus on the goals of their organization and then, you know, set, go- set financial budgetary goals to make sure that you're able to get there and that you stick to your budget. It also encourages communication between, between managers because it really forces people to work together in some ways through that budgeting process. Budgeting tool can also be very motivational. In fact, some companies use something called open book management, where they actually train the employees about, they educate them on the on basic financial concepts, and then set up a system where they can whereby they can look at some key financial data and understand how their work affects that data. It can be hugely motivating to certain teams. And you'd be surprised how well, how much it can change even the lowest level employee as far as helping them kind of relate their work to the financials and the health of the company. Like you might have some people in the, uh, in the warehouse. They'll be going, you know what? Hey, boss, if we start doing this and this, we could save quite a bit of money. That would help our, 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 our budgeting process, wouldn't it? Would not... Uh, help our our bottom line here in our department. They might say, hey, you know what? That's a fantastic idea. It can be hugely motivating, but it can also help uh, managers really be careful about watching unnecessary spending of money because they might be really, you know, maybe their annual bonus might be tied to the amount of profit that their particular area of the company generates. So it can be very motivating. When I worked for uh, a company in Maryland, uh, we were given the goal, every project manager was given the goal of 8% profit margin for uh, the projects that we managed. And so every time I spent money my or my employees asked to, had a, a spending request of some kind, I really, it forced me, the budgeting process forced me to really analyze those requests and make sure that I thought we were going to be able to truly generate more money than it cost (laughs) before I'd authorize it. So it can be hugely motivating and it can really help keep everyone on track. A couple of different ways to do budgeting. One is top down, one's bottom up. And, and they're probably pretty obvious just by the words, the titles, right? Top down budgeting is when manage, management of the company has a really good handle on um, how, much, how things work at different levels of the company, how much, what kind of costs and resources they really and truly need uh, to meet their goals. However, the larger the company gets, the less effective top-down budgeting really works. Not to say that large companies don't have some very smart, educated people um, managing them, but they start to lose sight of what it really takes to get things done at the lower levels of the company. So more and more companies are using a more participatory type of budgeting called bottom-up, where middle and supervisory level managers are given input into the budgeting process. Now, just because they're given input doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get their way, but it means that they're given input into the process. That tends to make do a couple of things. One, it makes budgets more accurate, but two, it also, by the way, makes employees feel like they have more of a say in things that affect their work. And certainly budgets affect their work. So that can be hugely motivating for employees. Uh, They'll feel better about the company if they feel like they had a say in managing it. It'll make them feel like 
management cares about them and their success and what they have to say, their opinions. So it can be motivational for in a, in a couple of different ways. There's some different types of budgets uh, that we can think about too. An operating budget essentially has a, is, there's a three-step process to developing an operating budget. One, you develop a sales budget. All those expenses related to sales. You then step two, you develop a production budget, right? Anything used to uh, those budgets for direct la like direct labor costs, direct materials costs, manufacturing overhead. And step three of an operating developing an operating budget would be creating a budgeted income statement. So you're looking at that. Uh, you're, develop, you're developing that budget to give spit out a profit or a loss at the, at the end of it. Now, obviously, you're going to budget for, most likely for making a profit, obviously. Uh, in a financial budget, you're really focusing on those financial goals and kind of digging into the resources you need. So cash budget is going to identify your short-term fluctuations in cash flows. And then your capital expenditure part of the financial budget is going to identify your company's, uh, any investments your company's planning uh, in fixed assets. So out of that capital expenditure budget, you get a budgeted balance sheet. After you combine the information from the cash budget and the capital expenditure budget, you'll get a budgeted balance sheet. All right, and then when you combine all of those budgets into one, you're gonna get a master budget. A master budget, it's a better view of what a master budget would look like. So you can see those different parts we just talked about. Your sales budget would be part of that. You put that together with your, uh, your production budget, your selling and administrative, Expenses would be part of that also, the budget you have for that. All of these, those things combined would be put into a master budget. One thing too, uh, the pr preparation of the master budget usually starts with your sales budget. Remember that it ends with a budgeted balance sheet. If you do that, you'll probably do well in the test questions on that, on master budget, by the way. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of ways that you can do budgets, by the way. We, we understand that, I think we all know that for most businesses, sometimes the year, sales are better than in other times of the year. It fluctuates depending on what type of business it is. For example, retail, we, we are entering, this is, if it is October, you're entering the holiday season, so Retail sales is definitely higher, but what happens right after New Year's? It plummets for a while because everybody overspent during the holidays and now they're really tightening their belts and they're not doing as much shopping. So why would you want to use a static budget if that is the case? Well, there are some advantages. I mean, it can make, it's easier, you know, to kind of deal with an average sales uh, level but the problem is, like I say, sales usually fluctuate over the course of the year, then things start to get out of whack, right? So one thing that you can do to kind of meet in the middle, you can prepare a flexible budget where you're kind of developing a variety of budgets, budget scenarios that are at different uh, possible sales level. The good thing about doing that is that things don't hit you out of left field. When things change in the marketplace, um, you have a financial plan, you have a, uh, something prepared in advance, you know exactly what to do. You've already thought through some of those possible eventualities. All right, so some pros and cons, just kind of looking at, uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, you guys can read through those, uh, but just kind of looking at the difference between financial accounting and managerial accounting. Remember, financial accounting, you're you're primarily uh, 
looking to provide your external stakeholders uh, with financial statements that, are, that use GAAP. Whereas managerial accounting, the individual uh, employees within the organization are looking for information to help them do their job better, to meet their goals better for their group. So uh, whereas financial accounting will mostly focus on the financial, managerial accounting will also include additional information. The output on the financial side would be financial statements. On the other side, it could be a wide variety of highly customized reports uh, specifically for internal use. Timing on financial side, you're typically doing that on a predetermined schedule for sure. Whereas managerially, uh, you could operate on any type of schedule that makes sense for your business. It doesn't have to be on a predetermined schedule. On the financial side of things, you're using GAP. On, on the managerial side, it could be GAP, uh, but most likely you've got some more customized ways of doing things. All right, just a couple things on cost. I want you to understand that you, know, you have out-of-pocket cost means any kind of a cost that you have to pay out of uh, the money in an account, in your accounts. Whereas an implicit cost, that's something that maybe you've already paid for. Uh, if you've got a piece of equipment that you already own, you don't, if, if you need to make something that you normally make, you don't have to go out and buy an, another machine to do that. You've already, if you already own one that does it. Right, and it has the capacity to do it. So, when you use that, in that case, it would be an implicit cost. Now, also important is this distinction between a fixed cost and a variable cost. So, a, a fixed cost doesn't doesn't change as production changes. For example, if your company had the lights on on the factory floor. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, whether production was going on or not, then you could say that the cost of the electricity for the lights being on would be a fixed cost. But a variable cost would be maybe the, inner, the electricity that the machines themselves would be using, right? So if you're not producing anything, then you wouldn't have any electricity cost for those machines. But if you were producing, then you'd have an electricity that you'd be paying for for all those machines to be run. That So you could say that in that case, the electricity that the machines use would be a variable cost. And so while well, we're talking about machines, so an, uh, maybe a better example, um, think about the machines themselves. As you, if you decided to ramp up production and maybe add another shift, for example. Let's say that your production facility was running two shifts, two eight-hour shifts, and you decided that you were going to add a third eight-hour shift without buying additional machines. Well, your machines are going to have to be run a lot more, eight hours more. There's going to be more wear and tear on them, more maintenance, more repairs, more replacement parts, maybe more additional tools. So you would say then that, the, that your machinery, the use of your machines is a variable cost because it fluctuates with production. All right, and then this is this, we'll finish up with this idea of uh, costs. Uh, let me get caught up here. As, as, when you start assigning costs to particular products. So a direct cost, just like it's a, uh, the slide shows, it's incurred directly as a result of some specific cost object. So one of the examples of a direct cost would be like wage payments that you make to workers that are directly involved in producing your company's products or service. Like I work for a company that did project management uh, we would consider direct costs, like the salaries of all of us who worked on project teams, 
that were paid out of the comp- the money that customers were actually paying for that project. Whereas the salaries of the people that worked at headquarters, like in the HR department or accounting department, they were said to be indirect costs because they just kind of work for general operations. So they were considered an indirect. Uh, and then activity-based costing. Um, essentially, that's where you're just trying to look at costs related to activity linkages between activities at your company. That anything that drive costs and uh, production between them. So that's just kind of an overview of accounting. Hopefully, this give you gives you uh, a basis for further study. Obviously, if you're a business major, you're going to have to take uh, an accounting course where you'll you'll dig into these concepts in a lot more detail and actually start doing some accounting. One thing I would highly recommend is you go through this chapter and you're studying. Sure, memorize all these key terms, the definitions of these key terms, because you know good and well that half the test questions are going to be definitional. Here's some more. But that's only half of them. Half of the battle. The other half of doing well in these exams is being able to apply, know where these definitions fit into something practical, something useful. So what I would do is read the chapter one time. I would make sure I, I'm scrolling through my definitions, you know, my flashcards every day for each of these definitions. <coughs> then I would also go back back through the chapter, I would read one section and I would pause and make sure that I can apply what I'm reading to a real world problem. For example, there's a McDonald's example that goes all the way through chapters eight and nine. Make absolutely sure that you can follow that example as you read through the chapter. Only by doing that we really start to get a good handle on how to make practical use out of all the definitions that you see at the end of the chapter. Um, Another thing too that I would personally do is make sure that you make yourself a little index that you can use when, when you prepare for a test so that you can look up items quickly for anything that you forget, get stuck on, Answer all the questions that you know the answers to first, and then use your index to be able to look them up quickly. All right, just some test taking tips as a bonus for this this particular lecture. That's chapter eight.